Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, we're going to begin the program in just a few minutes. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we are going to be recording the event uh, and it will be posted on the Basic Sciences event website uh, within the next week. We are going to keep um, the audience muted throughout the program to minimize any background noise. Um, so just so you're aware of that. And um, if you have questions for the panelists, we'll, we'll have limited time to answer them. But if you do have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, and now it is my pleasure to welcome the Dean of Biological Sciences, um, Mike Botchen. Good evening and welcome. I'm Mike Botchen, the Dean of Biological Sciences in the College of Letters and Sciences at UC Berkeley together with Francis Hellman, the Dean of the Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. I'm really excited to be here this evening to kick off this uh, virtual series of science talks, celebrating basic science at Berkeley. Of course, I really do uh, wish that we were all meeting in person. Uh, it'd probably be a lot more fun. But the silver lining uh, uh, to these virtual events is that we can reach so many of our alums and friends living in different time zones. Uh, as you know, in many ways, Berkeley's history can be told as the story of paradigm shifting discoveries. From Ernest Lawrence's invention of the cyclotron that allowed scientists to understand the nature of isotopes and launch what was called in his day, the golden age of nuclear science, uh, where over the se over many se decades after Nobel laureates here at Berkeley were credited with discovering 16 elements, including every element from neptunium uh, to seaborgium, number 106. And going through a lot of history to this very moment uh, and uh, present time, where the recent discovery of Jennifer Doudna of the nature of the RNA-based CRISPR-Cas system and how to use a, a uh, an RNA to guide a nuclease to uh, cut chromosomes uh, that has allowed us to probe nature's genomes in ways that I predict here and around the world will extend biology in much the way the cyclotron did for, uh, for physics back in the day. Uh, Berkeley's contribution to humanity uh, are, are significant and continue to be so. So this, uh, tonight, uh, we're going to hear from three really fantastic scientists who do this type of research. Uh, and I hope uh, we leave you with a sense of Berkeley's excellence and possibilities that come from basic science. So this event is about basic science. So let me give a shot at what basic science actually is, at least from my perspective. The definition is really broad. Uh, but we're talking about something really radical. And here, I, I, I don't mean politically radical, but radical in the way uh, one might receive it if one's uh, looking for ways that fundamentally change our, our knowledge of nature and something far reaching and thorough, the deep ideas. It becomes basic, uh, it, it's sometimes called basic research with the aim of improving scientific theories. But here, here's what I feel is the secret sauce to uh, what I consider uh, radical, basic uh, scientific research. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, the more general it is, the more it's curiosity driven. And curiosity driven is really what I want to emphasize here. And I hope comes through. And the more basic it is, uh, the more likely it's going to be to be general throughout the universe here on Earth and everywhere. Uh, we're not engineers, but we rely on engineers often, and that's going to be a, something that we, we uh, interact with each other uh, here in this event and talk about. But we're not engineers in the sense that we're, our curiosity is not, how do we build a better bridge? A lot of what we do may help an engineer a thousand years from now to build a better bridge, or maybe in a few months. Uh, uh, the, the point of this meeting is to actually emphasize the, the, uh, the way the two areas of translation and basic discovery actually are dependent on each other. And basic discovery is the morning star of uh, uh, 
uh, technological advances. Okay, so before I pass the program over to Saul Perlmutter, who will be our moderator tonight, let me tell you a bit about him. Saul is the Frank and Karen Dabby Professor of Physics, and in 2011, he shared the Nobel Prize for discovering the accelerating expansion of the universe. A remarkable basic science story in and of itself. He's the leader of the International Supernova Cosmology Project and the director of Berkeley's Institute for Data Science, an executive director of Berkeley's Center for Cosmological Physics. His interest in teaching scientific style critical thinking for scientists and non-scientists alike led to Berkeley's courses on sense and sensibility and science and physics and music. And uh, Saul and I are looking forward to playing some violin duets together uh, in the future after COVID. Okay, over to you, Saul. Oh, thank you, Mike. So uh, first, let me uh, say good evening to everybody. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to everybody uh, here today on this topic. Um, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on what uh, Mike was just saying about basic science, because I, I just want to emphasize there's this funny, almost magical aspect of following curiosity-based research, which is that if you, if you try to solve problems by uh, just tackling the problem head on, you make advances and things have progressed incrementally that way. But there's something about the fact that when you follow curiosity and you just try to understand how the world works, somehow that's made it possible for us to leapfrog all sorts of problems. And I don't think the world that we see around us now, the, 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 uh, the very uh, Zoom that we're on, um, would, would, would exist if it weren't um, that uh, over the past, well, centuries and, uh, and very much in this past uh, you know, decades, um, you know, people follow curiosity and they've been able to uh, discover things that then allowed whole new prospects to open up. And, uh, and so I love that aspect. Um, that I, I really feel somewhat magical about basic science. And today we're uh, going to be uh, talking with three um, members of the faculty at Berkeley who are, uh, exemplify this, this kind of uh, basic curiosity driven research. And, uh, and I think you'll see the sense in which it opens up new prospects as well. Uh, obviously the kinds of questions that you, that you, that you find yourself asking in, the, in, this, in these basic contexts are these what seem almost philosophical questions. You know, how did, how did the universe come about? Um, what, what makes us human? Um, how, how did life get started? Um, you know, th these, are, these are the sorts of deep questions that end up turning into remarkably practical aspects of our world, um, but, but only because we were, we were pursuing something so, so deep and philosophical. So let me um, turn to the uh, introducing, begin by introducing the three amazing scientists that we have um, here today uh, that, that I'll, be, I'll, be, uh, I'll be talking with. And, uh, Let's delve into some and some of this question of how, how, how this all goes. Um, so first, I will introduce um, Hillel Adesnik, who is a professor of neurobiology, and his research focuses on the neural basis of sensory perception. His lab's goal is to understand how precise patterns of activity in our brain give rise to our mental experiences, and uh, and how it goes awry in neurological disease. So. So let me begin because we're, you know, we're talking about the kinds of curiosity that drive these, these, these studies. Let me just begin asking Hillel, um, what were the, the basic fundamental questions that sort of got you into this game? What, what were you wondering about? Sure, thank you. Thank you for hosting and thanks to the organizers. So to answer a question that this really started for me, you know, more than 20 years ago when I was a college student and I was taking a lot of classes both in biology but also in philosophy. And for me, the question was, you know, as a biologist at the time, I was majoring in biology, how can we understand the, what's going on in our head, how it generates everything in our external world, everything that we see and touch and feel and remember, uh, all takes place in the physical matter of our brain tissue. And that was the question that's you know, spurred me into neuroscience research and ultimately to a PhD and ultimately to my current uh, research program here at Berkeley. So then maybe I, the next obvious question is, um, your current research, how is it getting at that question that you wanted to know? Yeah, so um, this really, it's, it's the center of what we're trying to achieve. We're, um, we try to focus on one aspect of that larger question. And for us, it's what we call the neural code, or what neuroscientists consider neural code. And I'll give you the analogy I can make is to the genetic code we've heard a little bit about, where you can go from DNA to proteins. 
inside our brain, there must be a code between activity of brain cells, of neurons, and all of our experiences, what we feel and what we sense. And so the goal of my research in our laboratory is to develop the tools and then use those tools to understand and ultimately interpret these patterns of activity in the brain to understand exactly how we can recognize someone's face or smell a rose and so forth. So well, maybe uh, we, you know, we've asked everybody to bring along a few slides. Um, would, would that be a good way to sort of make this concrete to show us a little bit what you're up to? Sure, sure. Let's see. Okay. Hopefully you can uh, see that. Oh yeah, so very, very briefly, um, just a little bit about what we do. So my goal, the goal of my lab's research is to understand the sort of neural code, the transformation from a neural firing in your brain into what you feel and experience. And the way we do this is we have, there's two sides of this. One is to read the neural code and one is to write it. And so to just give you sort of a, hopefully you can see this on Zoom, the movie, this is a literal movie of brain activity. Now, of course, this is activity in a mouse. We study the laboratory mouse and we're literally peering into its, uh, into its brain. It's been genetically engineered to allow us to see its activity. And these are brain cells flashing on and off as the animal in this case is touching things with its whiskers. And so this allows us to read the neural code. And for neuroscientists for, for decades have been correlating patterns of activity in the brain with different levels of scale and resolution with what the animal or the person is experiencing. But what my lab has trying to do is to go beyond what we call correlation and to move into causation. What does this specific pattern actually drive in your experience? And to do that, we turn to a technology that's known as optogenetics in which we can literally use little beams of lasers as depicted in this drawing here and turn on and turn off different brain cells or generate different patterns sort of controlled by the experimenter and ask, what does the animal experience? In our case, what does the mouse experience? Just to give you a movie of that, this is a, also a movie of brain activity, but these circles are where we shoot laser beams at individual cells in the brain and we activate them in different spatial and temporal patterns, much as they would be activated normally. And the idea here is if we can drive specific patterns and then drive perceptions in the animal, which we quantify in a number of ways, we can ultimately understand the underlying logic for activity in the brain and sensory percepts and behaviors. Uh, so just to, to summarize that real quickly, we measure activity in the brain, in this case of a mouse, as it touches things or sees things. We then replay like a piano, we play the music, you know, the activity of the neurons directly back into the brain in different patterns. And by doing so, it's a little bit like we can derive a sort of translation or like as if we had a Rosetta Stone to understand this logic, this code, to put it something intuitively meaningful to us, which is sensory perception. So the, so the obvious question uh, next is, um, how far has this gotten? Uh, what, you know, what do you now understand and, and uh, how, how, how much can you tell from this? What, where, where are you? So I'd say we're, we're very much at the beginning. Um, and some of the key insights that we've now achieved in a number of groups also we're working around the world is that remarkably, it only takes a very small number of brain cells to drive a perception. It, it could be as few as just five or 10, uh, which is remarkable given that there are literally you know, billions of neurons in your brain. And so we're at the very beginning of this to understand what is so special about different groups of neurons. There's so many different types of experiences that of course you can have, and somehow at the core is some small group of cells. And so we're trying to understand what matters about which cells, how many cells, when they fire, the sequence that they fire. It's essentially like words in a language. If we're trying to go in there without a dictionary, we need to derive that. And that's, that's the goal here. Can you give an example of any sort of one perception and how you recognize that the, the animals is, is uh, having that perception and one code that you have been able to, to identify? So I'd say that the, the simplest level code is that you can train an animal like a mouse to press two levers, lever A, lever B. And if it experiences, for instance, if you touch its whiskers on one side versus the other side, it'll press lever A and lever B. So the very simplest, and there's definitely more interesting ones would take more time, but is you can activate neurons that represent one side of the animal's whiskers of one versus the other, and you can fool the animal as if it really was something was touching the whiskers. So far, um, you're, you're working with uh, the parts of the brain that represent presumably uh, direct sensory um, elements. Um, what is your sense for how representative that is for how other parts of the brain will, will also work? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. I can give you two answers. On the one hand, an, an anatomical answer, which is that what's remarkable about the cerebral cortex, which is the structure on the outer part of your brain that's so massively expanded in humans compared to rodents, but it exists in mice. It's, it's remarkably similar. You take a little piece of it anywhere in that entire sheet and it looks very similar. So we do believe that the underlying components, because they're similar, it's like words, if you string them together, they'll have meaning. It's true that other parts of your brain that are going beyond sensory, they're, they're things about emotion, about directed action, about decision making. And there are definitely other groups that are also studying this. And they also have found that small groups of neurons can represent, for instance, a decision to go left or to go right. So some of the principles will be common and of course some will, will be different, but I think that's what's pretty exciting about this. And, and it sounded to me like the, the part that's, uh, that's so surprising is you know, how these, you know, you know, billions of, of cells um, the, that it's a, such a small number that is, is, is already um, meaningful in, in this sense. Do you yeah. think, and, and do you think that will also be the case when you get more complex, um, complex thoughts uh, in, in a brain other than, yes, I feel my, my right whisker you know, flick as opposed to my left whisker? Right. Yeah, another excellent question. I mean, I think the idea is that um, what we're doing here is we're triggering something that's sort of able to complete itself. So it actually does take thousands of neurons across the brain to drive the percept, to drive a perception, the smell of a rose. It's not just three or four neurons. But the idea about the cortex uh, that we study is that a few of them are able to just push it over the cliff and that it goes into a certain state that represents that. And what the way you get these different states is through experience. And that's why learning and experiencing many different things is so important to ultimately generate our, our perceptions. At least that's, that's a hypothesis that we're working on. So stepping back, um, just to give everybody like a sense of scale of, of what it is that you're that you're that you're working with here, um, can you can you give a, a sense for you know uh, how fast are these different events that we're talking about um, and you know how many are going on simultaneously at any given moment um, you know and maybe even and also maybe how complex is the code um, that you're trying to read um, maybe those three questions you know, might be interesting so first you know what's the uh, how fast is this is this activity happening. So yeah, neural activity happens on the scale of milliseconds. And so a lot of these, you can stimulate or look at neurons that are firing in fractions of a second. 100 milliseconds is often sufficient, or even less in many cases, for an animal to make a decision based on a sensory input. So it can be very fast. Or there are cases where it requires accumulating evidence. Sometimes something that you know very well, the face of a person you recognize extremely well, might only take a fraction of a second. If it's somebody that you haven't seen in a while, it could take quite a while. So activity happens on the scale of milliseconds, but say the perception or the decision that you've experienced a person can take, can take seconds. We're, we're more operating on the scale of milliseconds. And your, and your second question was? So then the next, next one was the, uh, how many, first of all, uh, do we think are going on simultaneously in, mm -hmm. even in, let's say, just the motor you know, or, or just the sensory uh, cortex of these of this animal. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's a, yeah, we could talk a long time. So, I mean, what I would say is that, of course, our senses are constantly processing information, our retinas, our skin, our entire body. And what's remarkable about the brain that we haven't talked about is that despite that profusion of information, which is indeed coming into our brain, uh, what our brain does, at least perceptually, is it focuses its attention to presumably most relevant, the most salient. I mean, you could direct your attention right now to your foot or your leg, your arm, or what you're seeing what you're smelling, but you're probably focusing on one thing that you find particularly interesting or relevant. So there's a lot of information and what actually filters through to maybe the higher areas where which you're actually making decisions to do, you know, decide your next behavior is going to be a tiny fraction of that. And when the uh, brain is, is sending these signals around, um, you know, presumably it's interpreting it in some way and then making a code that you're trying to pick up, um, uh, how how complex do you think these codes either you already know they are or do you think they do you suspect they can be um what what does it you know obviously that you know it's not a morse code it's uh what, what, how would you describe um the, the sense of complexity yeah I, mean, I guess the term that is often used is high dimensional codes and so we do have millions of neurons and an obvious question is even a, if you take the mouse for instance which has let's say 20 whiskers or 24 whiskers there's even 10,000 neurons that represent one whisker and you think that's like a finger it's, it's actually a lot of rich information. We were, I was simplifying it down, but of course there's a lot of information we can get from our fingertips, texture, shape, angle, curvature. And so the codes are actually fairly high dimensional, but each element of that code, say representing the, sh the curvature of a surface can be simplified. Ultimately, a lot of this information is then synthesized into what we call more like a gestalt percept, into something that you recognize as you know, the shape of your computer mouse or your keyboard. 
And as an experimentalist, when you're trying to pick up these codes, these signals, are, we, are these in the form of these, uh, you know, basically a spike of, of a, um, and, and a whole chatter of spikes going down a neuron? Is that, is that what you're actually trying to record and then interpret? Exactly. And so the movie I showed you was we actually use imaging using microscopes. The, the spikes themselves are electrical and sometimes we use electrodes. I'd say where the field that I work in has moved more recently is using photons, using lasers, simply because of throughput, because you can image many, many, many more neurons at a time. And we can use tricks to turn those spikes into light, which is what we pick up. And so this field has now moved. You have, for instance, you have functional MRI that people are probably familiar with that images the entire brain at millimeter resolution. And we're, of course, we're looking at micron resolution. So we're looking at imaging between thousands to tens of, tens of thousands of these spiking neurons. And what you will find, perhaps most interestingly, is that for any given stimulus, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of cells that fire. Very small and are, fraction. And are you really able to tell, tell me uh, you know, or, 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 or know um, which of tens of thousands of neurons has spiked at any given you know, fraction of a second? I mean, that's our, certainly that is our goal. I would say currently what's achievable is to image maybe about 100,000 neurons, which is a huge advance in the wow. last five, 10 years. And of those 100,000, which is not all the ones that are relevant, unfortunately there are millions, and this is talking about a mouse, a human has orders of magnitude more. Um, but this is where the, the technology side that's driven, for instance, my lab collaborates a lot with engineers. We do basic science, but the engineering is fundamental to that. And this allows us to scale up what we can see. So we're not biased. We can look at the whole picture and then see what, what matters. So, uh, so this sounds, um, sounds incredible. Um, and the opto engineering that you're describing, uh, optogenetic engineering, um, just say a little bit more about that. Cause my understanding is that that's actually a reasonably new element that's come into this basic science. That's right. I would say in about the last five, 10 years, there's been two components. One is a genetic component to allow neurons to respond to light that don't normally. You know of the cells in the eye that respond to light. We're artificially making neurons like the ones you see behind me sensitive to light so we can you know, do these perturbations, these experiments. And the engineering technology that we use is something called holography. You probably, I'm sure you're filled with holograms. Many of them have seen them. It's just a three-dimensional pattern of light. You can see like holographic displays like in Star Wars and it's turning it on its head. We shoot three-dimensional patterns of light using lasers that intersect and interfere in the right pattern so that we can choose which neurons to activate. And so the technology that was developed here with my colleagues in engineering, and of course it was also developed somewhat elsewhere, allows us to actually shape lasers into this three-dimensional pattern, into a hologram, so we can and change that, you know, millisecond by millisecond to replay the activity. So there's the somewhat scary sounding aspect of it, um, of, of uh, being able to, um, it, it sounds like I'm actually have a, an animal act a bit as a marionette um, that you in, in principle are able, I assume, to play a pattern that then um, will cause an effect. Um, in, uh, uh, yes, that is true. Um, what we like to put a slightly different spin on that, that ultimately this is a basic science question, but ultimately we do imagine that what this can do is become what's called a cortical prosthesis or a neural prosthesis. I'm sure people have heard of these in the retina or in the cochlea where you might lose the cells that transduce the original sensory inputs and you replace that with an artificial device. Then there are people who lose their eyes entirely. So you can't do a retinal prosthesis or you lose your cochlea entirely. And so what you can do is you can have a prosthesis that would go directly into your brain. Uh, and actually there are groups that are working on this with electrodes and we hope uh, electrodes are very low resolution. We hope with photons uh, that we can do this with such high precision, not to control a person, but to give them back the richness of experience that they've lost due to some sort of trauma. So I'm, so I'm, uh, I could go on with this for hours, but I'm, uh, I'm, I've been, I've, I carefully asked to be buzzed um, when I have to move on. So I will um, pause the questions. We'll uh, hopefully have a little time to come back to, uh, to Hillel uh, a little bit later and introduce the next of our, of our great uh, scientists today. But thank you, Hillel. That was, yeah. That's just fascinating. Um, okay, so the uh, second uh, one of our, of our uh, speakers today is um, Heather Gray, um, who's a professor in my own uh, physics department. And her research interests um, include studying the recently discovered Higgs boson and probing what's called the standard model of particle physics and applications of artificial intelligence and quantum computing to particle physics, actually. So I, let me go back to ask Heather the same question that, that we, we started with, um, which is, 
what, are, what kinds of deep questions um, pulled you in to particle physics in the first place? What, what were the fundamental basic questions that, that, that you were curious about? Yeah, so hi, thanks for, thanks for having me here. So I think for me, the basic question, and maybe there's actually two of them, is what is everything made of, really at the most fundamental and smallest possible scale, and how does everything interact with each other? So with that as the, the starting question that, we, that was driving you, um, then what, uh, what became the, the experiment that you, uh, that you started to work on? Sure, so I work on the ATLAS experiment, which is at the Large Hadron Collider, which I'll show you just a bit later. Um, and what we were, have been after is the one you mentioned, is finding this Higgs boson, which was the last missing particle in the standard model. So um, maybe once again, let me see, which, which route should I go? Should I, uh, I could either have you start showing the slides or may I just first ask you the question about why we should care about the Higgs boson, um, just because People have heard the, heard the term, I, I, I imagine, um, especially people who are here today on, on, on this call. Um, but uh, say, say a little bit more about um, wh what it was that made the Higgs boson such an important target. Yeah, so the Higgs boson, I think I like it because it's particularly intriguing because we have this beautiful model, beautiful mathematical model, which is the standard model. And everything worked very well, except that it predicted that every single particle didn't weigh anything at all, had zero mass. And that was a small problem because experiment after experiment would measure the particle masses. It was quite clear that was wrong. And so the Higgs boson in some sense is a mathematical trick that allows the theory to keep all the massless particles that it likes, but also add the masses to the everyday particles consistent with what we observe. And I, I think it's hard, I imagine, to get across the, uh, the sense in which how that happens. But uh, do you want to say a word, you know, just to give people a feel for what, what it is that, uh, that's going on that makes um, a particle in, in, in turn create, um, have all the other particles have mass? Yeah, so that's a tricky one. And I, I play with various different analogies to try and explain it. I guess one that I kind of like is thinking about having a field throughout the universe of the Higgs boson. And when particles move through this field, they interact with it. And by that interaction, they gain mass um, to do it. So that's one of them, but let me be honest, it's not perfect. And in fact, to really explain this one, um, we need to go and do a quick course in, in field theory. Right, that was, that, was, that was going to be my guess that this was, this was a tough one to get, to get across in a trivial way, but I, I think that captures the, the, the style of explanation that, that, that we get. Um, all right, so tell me, I mean, you're doing experiments. So tell, tell me a little bit about how the experiments work with all this, and maybe this one, this might be the time for the slides again. I assume I uh, that would help. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and show you share my slides uh, to do it. All right. So this used to be the view that I would see very often in pre-COVID times, um, because this is the view you see when flying into Geneva in Switzerland, and you can actually see the airport there. It's the line behind the experiment LHCb, and what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's largest accelerator, also the world's coldest laboratory, which is located 100 meters underground. Um, so in this collider, we collide protons, and there are a number of different experiments, all labeled in white. And my experiment, um, the one that I've been working on since my PhD, is the ATLAS experiment, which is located just opposite the CERN site um, here. And I want to show you a small um, video, which is actually going to show you what happens to the protons when they actually are heading towards the LHC. And as you notice, we've got two bunches. They're going through various different steps of accelerator. And in each step, they're getting accelerated up to higher and higher energies. Now they're actually injected into the LHC, object, uh, accelerated up to the top energy, and we're gonna zoom in inside the tunnel. Notice there's some nice stunner model graffiti on the side there. We're now zooming along as a proton along the dipole magnets ready within the LHC tunnel. And as we go inside, we can actually see that within the proton, it's actually these quarks that are bouncing around. Up ahead, there's an experimental cavern. This is my experiment, Atlas. And we've actually timed things such that the two bunches of protons are going to collide in the center of the Atlas detector. When they collide, they are destroyed and we produce a whole bunch of particles um, with the energy. And depending on what happens, some of those particles that we might make there 
could actually be something interesting. In fact, of course, I cheated. I'm showing you what a Higgs boson would look like in the Atlas detector itself. And you can see all the different energy deposits as the colors in our different um, detectors. So that's how we actually make the Higgs boson. And now I would like to show you how we detect it. And this is actually a, a plot of the data that we get from my experiment, but it's kind of a movie as well. So what I'm going to show you is how the data actually came in. If you imagine looking and analyzing the data day by day, and this is back in 2011. So what we're looking at is we're actually going to see um, events where there are two photons. And we ask the question, if those photons came from some particle, what mass would it have? Okay, and so I'm gonna play the video and you'll notice that as um, time goes on in the top right, the data is really increasing. You notice all these wiggles, these are just statistical fluctuations in the data. But if you look closely, maybe you start to spot something that's actually appearing. There's this little peak that's kind of um, there in excess of the background. And that little peak there, that is actually how we detected um, the Higgs boson. Now I'm gonna play it just one more time, um, if I can get it to work correctly. And what you, I want you to ask the question is, at what point do you think we've actually seen something? If you're looking at this data, at what point are you going to start, you know, shouting and say, hey, we found a new particle. Is it now? Is it a bit later? Or is it really by the time we get to the end of the plot? And that was really the question that we actually had to answer, because this is how we were looking at the data day by day. Now, OK, so I've been, uh, I've been trying to teach a course in scientific style critical thinking uh, to undergraduates at Berkeley. And, um, we I've been showing them exactly this plot at one point um, with the and trying to point out to them that um, when you're trying to make that decision, do we actually find something? It's not trivial because there are lots of little bumps and wiggles. And you ask yourself, is that bump right there um, that happened to be right in the middle of your plot? I assume not coincidentally. Um, uh, the the, um, the you know the signal of something real, or could it just be more noise that that bounced around? So describe a little bit more how it is that one comes to the conclusion that that one really is real and not the one, you know, there's another little bump a little to the left that wasn't quite as big, but it was, you know, probably just noise. Um, what, what, how, how does that work? So maybe I can give you two answers there. I'll give you the official answer and then I'll give you the sociological um, answer. So the official answer is that we've actually come to agreement about something which we call the statistical significance. And this is just a measure for the probability that it would be just a fluctuation that we're looking at. And in particle physics, we've set the criteria pretty high. We allow ourselves to be wrong one in 3.5 million times. So we are very nervous about being wrong um, to do it. And so that's the sort of first order answer. But then the second answer is if you actually have data and you have a bump in it, because of course we've had many bumps and many of them have gone away. They become, there's a process there. First, you ask the questions, what could be wrong? And you investigate and try to check, you know, could I have perhaps miscalibrated my detector? Or could I have forgotten to do something um, in my data analysis? And then over time, as each of those checks um, come up negative, you grow more and more confident. But for the Higgs boson, the moment when I was really sure we'd found a particle was the day of the seminar, because we have a competing experiment, CMS, and they went first. Of course, I knew what we had. And when CMS actually showed us that they had a bump in the same data set at pretty much the same mass, that was when I was quite sure that we'd actually discovered a new particle. How, how strong was the mass prediction um, be, from the theory of, ahead of time? Were you only looking at right the middle of that graph or were you looking you know, on all sides of that bump and, uh, and it happened to turn out to be there? Any of those would have counted as a, um, as a proof of the Higgs. Yeah, so in the, in the standard model, there's actually um, no prediction for the Higgs mass. So it, it could have had all sorts of different values. However, there were some experimental constraints. So we had a sort of loose idea. You saw that it was at 125 GV. That's actually 125 times the mass of the proton. It could have been somewhere between about 100 and about 1,000 um, GV. So there was a pretty wide um, range to, to look at um, to see it. However, its mass has lots of implications. In fact, they tell us all sorts of things about what other beyond the standard model physics could actually be real. So all right, let me come back to that in one second. And for, but before we go away from the experiment itself, let me ask, um, just because I don't think most people have a sense of the, of this, of the intricacy of the experiment and of what it is that you're 
that you're actually tracking when you're tracking all of those particles that are coming out. Um, I think behind you on the screen is, I think, a representation of the detector. Um, and I think what may not be obvious is that um, it looks about the, you know, the height of your head on, in the picture. In fact, um, my memory, I've actually visited, uh, visited it one time. My memory is that something like, what, 10 stories high, six stories high? <laughs> Um, uh, it, you know, and and uh, you know, you, you can climb you know around it, and it has how many uh, channels of of altogether of, of detectors? Do you think are are actually measured at any given moment? Sure. So actually, this is the pixel detector that's hiding behind me. So this is actually the piece right at the center of Atlas. The full one is, as you say, it's um, forty meters long, twenty meters high, um, really gigantic. But in terms of the number of channels, we have about a hundred million individual channels that come out. And I used to make a joke that, you know, if we could actually find someone to fund each of our channels, maybe one dollar each, um, we would have a way to actually fund the full experiment um, to do it. And so um, then put this together for why is it that one has any confidence that you're actually understanding an event when, when that, you know, that spray of particles comes out? Um, uh, are you actually Recognizing the energy and and uh, you know and mass of you know of, of, and, and you know and, uh, velocities of every single one of them. Um, yes and no. So not quite every particle. Um, some of the very low momentum ones we don't actually measure, but we measure many thousands of particles per event, and we're after not just their energies and their velocities. We actually also want to know um, what type of particle they are. Is this an electron? Is this a photon? And so we have special detectors which are designed to combine their information to tell us exactly which um, type of particle we have. So in the end, people are, you, you end up feeling very confident that once you understand this whole spray, you know basically what happened and what they track back to, what the original, um, uh, you know, and I guess what you're really looking for is what the original elements were that, that broke apart. Yes, that's right. And in fact, we even do more than that because we know the energy of our proton beam very accurately. So we can even detect the particles we can't see. What we do for that is we actually measure everything we can see, we sum it up, get the total energy, compare it to know what was put in, and we can know what was there that we couldn't see and also where it went, um, which I find pretty remarkable. I, I think it's just amazing. Um, so let's come back then to, to the implications of, of the whole thing. Uh, so what kinds of, of you know, things do these masses tell you? Um, what sort of surprises um, have you been finding? And where does it lead you next? What do you think the directions will be um, coming uh, out of all this? Yeah, so the mass of the Higgs, which you, which you were asking about before, that turns out to be really important. Because in fact, if it had been lower, that would have actually told us that some new theories, for example, things like supersymmetry would have been true. So that would have been really exciting. On the other hand, had it been a bit higher, something like 140 instead of 125, that would have actually told us that our standard model was true for all different energy scales. So that would have been pretty depressing. Of course, um, nature ended up in the middle um, at neither of those. Um, so what it tells us is that we don't quite know um, yet. And so that means there's some thinking to be done. The other point is that it actually tells us that our universe isn't quite stable. We're actually in this edge of instability if one looks into it. But don't worry, it doesn't mean anything like the universe is going to de de decay tomorrow. We're talking about many billions of years, but it's still something that I find particularly intriguing. And of course, it's, it starts getting into my, in, into my areas of, uh, of research in, interest next. But um, tell me then, how is the community going to move forward? What, what, is, what, what next um, will people be able to do, given the, the information they have right now? Because I know that's, uh, that's sort of the big, you know, particle physics does these gigantic planning exercises where people all over the world try to figure out what are they going to work on? Because as you saw, you know, these experiments require almost everybody working together. Yeah, so we're not done with the LHC first up. Um, in fact, we're upgrading it and it's gonna come back in a few years with even more data at even higher rates. But indeed, we're going through some of this community planning process. And this has been an international um, effort where various different um, countries have, have, have planned different things. I would say there are a couple competing ideas. So one is let's collide electrons and positrons, either in a circle or in a straight line, or perhaps we could build an, a gigantic proton collider, this one going 100 kilometer tunnel and going up to 100 um, TV. And each of these has various different um, pros and cons. So I would say the, the discussion is still ongoing. 
well, I, I, I once more I can keep keep asking you more on this, but I, I'm once more getting buzzed that um, that my my uh, our, our, our time is up on this round, and I hope we'll get back to you again with a few more questions. Um, but thank you, um, Heather. That, that that's uh, that's really fun. Um, all right. So our our third speaker um, and uh, today and and, uh, and to, to round to round this out, off uh, the, the series out, um, it, I I want to introduce introduce you to is uh, Britt Cascella. And, uh, and Britt is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology, and she's interested in how species interactions influence genetic diversity. So she's, by, by combining evolutionary theory on coevolution, population dynamics, and infection genetics, she directly tests the underlying assumptions and predicted outcomes of host, host pathogen and microbial interactions through the lens of human health and agricultural sustainability, actually. So uh, welcome, welcome, Britt. Hi, so, I'm delighted to be here. So Britt, let me go do once more, um, go back uh, to this question of fundamental basic science. Um, what, what were the questions that, that got you into this, whole, into this whole study in the first place? What, what did you, uh, what were you curious about? What were you wondering about? Yeah, so I think for me, what hooked me initially and still has me hooked is this question of blending timescales. So as an undergraduate, we were taught that evolution happened a long time ago. And as an undergraduate researcher, I was working in a lab working on pathogens and did an experiment, an experimental evolution study and watched evolution happen within my senior year. <laughs> so at that point I was hooked and, and it's kept my interest since. So, all right. So then what did that lead to then in your, uh, in your research? What, how, how are you getting at this? How are you getting at these questions now? Yeah, so where I think this blending of time skills is very exciting at the moment is how hosts interact with microbes and their microbiome. So you've probably heard the microbiome is important to shaping host health, our behavior, even our mood. And, and by and, the way, yeah. if I can interrupt you for a second, um, give a quick reminder to everybody who doesn't remember what the term microbiome is referring to. Yeah, so generally the microbiome is all the microorganisms that live in and on us. That's that's my work. Every, 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 every bacterium and, uh, every, you know, and, and, and all the related elements, uh, all the related uh, life forms. That's it. Yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, that's great. Um, so this question of the microbiome evolving on a time scale that's really different than the host. So I think a lot about trees. And one of the questions that I started thinking about just when I started my lab here at Berkeley is um, why they exist at all. Uh, because pathogens, for example, should have evolved to, you know, virulence and to pathogenicity to wipe out tree species many times over. And trees don't even have an adaptive immune system, and yet here they are. Uh, and we think that a lot of that has to do with the microbes, the commensal microbiome that lives on trees. So, so describe a little about your approach, and once more, maybe this is the, the, mo the moment for slides. Perfect. I will do that. Let's see here. Okay. So I've, as I've just introduced, the microbiome is the bacteria that live in and on a host organism. And we know, for example, that a microbiome is important in shaping health, but we don't yet know why. One of the resounding patterns that seems to be true is a diverse microbiome tends to be better. And what do I mean by diverse? I mean many different species. So all species in check, no, none that become too dominant. And so you think about this in terms of our own microbiome and how does a host keep a microbiome both diverse but also devoid of pathogens? And so a lot of what my lab does is try to figure out how hosts both let in nice commensals, bacteria, but keep out pathogens. And we do this in part through theory and in part through experiments. And I'll just give you one example here. This is a, a theoretical exercise that I did with my collaborator, Jess Metcalf at Princeton. And we just built some ideas to say, you know, is there an optimal immune response where a host can figure out over evolutionary time how much to invest in an immune system to allow the good commensals to colonize us and keep the pathogens out. And the problem, of course, is that you're always going to make errors on both sides. So you can all, you're always going to be excluding some good commensals and accidentally letting some good pathogens in. But as I said, something that's clear is diversity tends to be good. It tends to be associated with good health. And so what my lab focuses on is how that diversity is maintained. 
And something that you might not know about the microbiome is it's not just bacteria. We hear the most about bacteria, but it's also fungi and archaea and also viruses. And one of the viruses that are particularly important for the microbes living in and on us are bacteriophages. And a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria and does not infect human cells, will never infect human cells, but is very specific to bacterial cells. And what this means is that by killing bacteria, you can both use phages as a way of controlling bacterial pathogens, but also because there are so many phages inside of us at any given time, they are having important impacts on our microbiome. And that's what we're really trying to unlock is what phages are doing naturally, and then maybe what we could, how we could use them to improve health. And so I'll just give you one quick example of how we do this. We use tomato as our model system in the lab, and we work on leaves because they're easy to work on, and they're also full of bacteria. So here's a little microbial print that I made by just taking a leaf and putting it on a Petri dish and letting all the microbes that were naturally on that leaf grow. And we can take off all the microbes, and we can also then put them back on to plants in a growth chamber in a sterile environment and ask very specific experimental questions. And we can also do that with all of the natural viruses, these bacteriophage viruses that infect the bacteria. And so we can experimentally manipulate whether we inoculate a plant with just the bacteria or with the bacteria and phages, and therefore we can isolate specifically what impact these viruses have on the microbiome. And so in this particular experiment, we did this. We inoculated tomato with either just the bacterial community or with a bacterial community where we also added bacteriophage viruses at the same time. And then we allowed ecology and evolution to take its course on the plant. And after only a week, we sampled and we used sequencing approaches to characterize the microbiome. And I'll just give you two quick outputs here. The first one is just diversity. So how many different bacterial species were on the leaf after a week? And what we discovered is that if the phages are there, diversity is higher. So in other words, phages are increasing microbial diversity, just as they do in theory, which I think is amazing. And then the second punchline was that these phages were also steering the microbiomes to be more similar. So I won't go into the details here, but on this graph here, you're looking at how different two plant microbiomes are from one another. And these two plants got the same inoculum. We sprayed them with exactly the same microbial community and phages. But when the phages are absent, then the, micro, the microbiomes kind of move off in different directions across different plants. But when we put the phages there, these phages steer the microbiomes in a similar direction. And we think this is incredibly exciting, um, both in terms of explaining microbial diversity, which we're still very far from doing, but also potentially in, in steering microbiomes and in increasing health. And I just want to end, I want to flag here, the other thing that I love about this study at the bottom here is it, had, it was led by a PhD student in the lab, but these three here are all undergraduates from Berkeley. And, the undergraduate community here is just fantastic, and the fact that they get to engage in these result in these experiments and see evolution happening in real time is is really fun for me. Yeah, no, actually, we, we, I should ask everybody else about that again, but I think uh, we almost all have had great uh, experiences with the undergraduates in our labs. So, um, in that last slide, um, I uh, can you um, just explain a, one step further? The it's sounding like the um, the the effect of the phages um, is to, in some sense, farm the, um, the biodiversity of, of the bacteria um, uh, in a way that you get a, a, a small range of differences, but a, a wide range of diversity. So it's very specific diversity that you're getting. Is, is, that, is that what you mean by this? That is what I mean. Now, I, should, I, I glossed over one important detail about bacteriophages, which I think is really important, which is that phages have many different life histories. So these viruses, some of them infect and lies or kill bacterial cells. And so most of what we're working with here are those type of phages, what we call lytic phages. And so in this experiment in particular, we did it over very short timescales. So the steering effect was the fact that some viruses went in and killed a whole population of cells, right? And of course, not all of them, but made depreciable, appreciable decreases rather in the bacterial population size. And just like viruses that infect us, uh, but these viruses, these phages are very host specific. So a phage will only infect one type of bacterium and not your entire flora. And so that's how they're, you know, if you have the same phages that you're applying, it's moving the microbiome diversity in a particular way because it's attacking a particular subset of the community. 
So in some sense, it's sort of thinning the, the, uh, the range of things, but it keeps diversity, but it only has very specific ones that are left by, by the end of this. That's exactly right. And what's really nice is that over longer timescales, I mentioned that these are evolutionary processes as well. Over longer timescales, I'm talking within, a, certainly within a human generation, but long from a bacterial perspective, what bacteriophages do is they evolve to infect the specifically whatever bacteria is most common in a community. And that's what we call kill the winner. And it's a beautiful theoretical idea. And it also works. It's, it's true. It's amazing. Oh, that, that's that's amazing. what the data tell us. So in some sense, it's sort of suppressing the, uh, the, the ones that are going to take over and keeping, yeah. a, a, and keeping it diverse. Ah, that's, that's really clever. Um, and, I, and I guess you can see why it would be evolutionarily advantageous for a virus. Exactly. Um, it's natural selection. The most hosts, that virus wins. Yeah. So, but that sounds like it's uh, not what you're, what, when you're running these experiments, you're actually using just a specific um, set of phages. And then you're inferring that that will happen when you actually uh, allow a process to go further, or is it that you're able to actually later go and look at what phages exist in a in a uh, more evolved population? Yeah, great. So we just received um, a big NSF Career Award, which is specifically focused on these much longer bacteriophage timescales. And for that, we're going back to trees away from tomato. And we have a project where we have pear trees that get fire blight disease, like they do in most orchards, pear and cherry and apples. And we have sampled them every month for five years. And so we're tracking these dynamics over very long timescales to ask this exact question. What are the longer term implications of this coevolution within a single host? Uh, and of course, now uh, with the ep epidemic, we're all becoming experts in detecting uh, viruses. But I should ask, um, are you actually able to um, easily recognize the full population of viruses that is, let's say, on a given tree's bacteria at any given moment? Short answer, no. <laughs> it's a huge hurdle for the field. So with bacteria, we have a very clever hack, which is all bacteria share one gene, the 16S housekeeping gene. Uh, and therefore, we can use that to view sequence data from the entire bacterial community. There is no such thing for viruses. There's no single conserved gene. And so we have lots of workarounds, but the short answer is we're learning more about viral diversity by the hour. I see. So that's, that, that's really sort of near the edge of the state of the art right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what, what else? What are the other kinds of questions that really will make a difference if you can get them in the next, you know, in the next few years? Where, where what will really help you uh, understand this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think luckily what we're trying to do in the microbiome field is explain how a community assembles and then stays stable. And what's really nice is that even though that particular question is quite new, it builds on decades of ecology. So we've been trying to explain why a forest is as diverse as it is for a long time. And actually the mechanisms are very similar because you know, trees have pathogens just like bacteria have phages. And so many of the principles are, are applicable. But that being said, we've still never, in community ecology more generally, we're still not very good at figuring out how to make a community look a, perfect, a specific way. And so I think many of the challenges of ecosystem engineering at larger scales are very similar to microbiome manipulation. But that's where we're all trying to get. How do you make a microbiome do what you want it to do, which is, of course, confer health. So just coming back to your original first uh, uh, you know, thought question, um, do you think that the answer for what, how it is that trees have managed to survive at all is just that they've co-evolved with um, the phages that keep their bacteria in check? Not just, certainly. Um, but I think that they have certainly co-opted the microbiome. And we know this is true because Plants have certain exudates, for example, that we know that don't seem to have any function other than to culture bacteria. And the same is true, for example, of breast milk in humans. There are things in there that, that cannot be um, used by the infant. They are there specifically to culture the microbiome. So I do believe that over these evolutionary timescales, we hosts, whether we be humans or trees, have leveraged the microbial diversity in and on us, absolutely. And I'm getting my, my two minute warning here, but just by the one question that I'm, I'm really trying to figure out is, uh, I'm curious about is, um, is there any sense when you're doing these kinds of studies that you can tell who is farming who? 
I mean, are, are, you know, how, is there any sense at all in which um, the phages are dominant and we're just the hosts that, you know, that get farmed by them or that the bacteria are dominant and the other, and the other two scales are the hosts? Or is it a complete balance? Is there, is, there any, is there any way to distinguish? It's a fantastic question. And I guess I would just say that it depends on my, um, how I feel about that depends a little bit on my mood because if I'm craving chocolate, and I'm in the mood to just believe I'm actually just a microbial vehicle, then I, I eat the chocolate because, you know, that, that's what my microbes are telling me to do. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a balance and it's a wonderful balance. I love thinking of myself as a part of a huge interaction network. <laughs> that's great. All right. Now, okay, I have to stop myself asking the next question on this one because I, I'm supposed to pause here um, and, uh, and do two things. One, I was going to ask a, a, a more uh, general question to get for all three of, 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 of our uh, faculty um, today uh, uh, that, that I thought is, is now brings it back to the fact that although everything I was saying earlier, I think is right about the fact that the um, that basic science is so much curiosity driven and it surprises us in the ways in which it ends up interacting with practical things that we really care about someday. Um, even so, it's also true that we're, we're doing it all in a very a rich context of practical technologies and things of that sort. So I was going to go, go through everybody one at a time, just ask them um, if you could just say a word about the ways in which either you actually had to invent new applied science to do your job uh, and to, to do your basic research, or that you had to actually learn whole areas that, of new applied um, techniques um, that that uh, that made it possible to do this because it's 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 a very much of a rich combination I think in, you know, usually so uh, if, if you guys don't mind let me just go back to uh, hello and let me let me uh, let me ask you um, where where do you see those interactions uh, most in your in your work yeah uh, yeah it's very clear so um, my training prior to coming to Berkeley was primarily in understanding how neural connections work using electrical methods molecular biology. And I knew nothing really, very little about optics, about light, about how to control light. And, and it turned out there was been, there's been an optical revolution in neuroscience for a number of reasons over the last one or two decades. And when I came here, I really teamed up with faculty, actually another junior faculty member, a few, that I sort of met almost by accident through students, through, through actually through our students. And we've joined forces. Uh, we were both like one or you know, here just for a couple of years and we developed this new technology together actually by really hiring the right people, I should say. It wasn't even really our brainchild. We, we know what we wanted to achieve and we had to develop this new type of microscopy that allowed us to activate uh, different cells in the brain. And so basically what I do now would be impossible. I knew there was a need, right? We knew as a biologist, I knew we, to answer these questions, we needed this technology and I knew I couldn't do it myself. And I knew that Berkeley, I mean, one of the attractions of coming to Berkeley was the incredibly rich and diverse faculty in engineering and in physics and so forth. So, so you basically are inventing your way through applied things to solving a basic fundamental question. Absolutely. Um, Heather, same, same, uh, same question. Where, what's, how do you see this interaction? Sure, so I'm gonna say, answer it a little differently um, because I think my favorite example is the fact that physicists wanted to find a good way to collaborate um, together. And in order to do that, they decided to invent a way in which you could transmit data over wires um, from one person to another. Of course, what I'm talking about is the World Wide Web, but it really is the case that it came out of our desire to be able to collaborate. And then, of course, um, its applications were way really beyond even our wildest dreams. I, I, I still remember that, that, that period as a, uh, as a young, uh, young grad student uh, when, when you know, all of our, my, my neighbors were particle physicists in, uh, on the hallway and everybody was starting to use this, uh, this sort of crazy thing where there's, you, know, you used to see new web pages appear every now and then. Oh, there's a new web page that just came out. So <laughs> no, I think it's a great example. Um, let me, okay, and then finally, uh, turning back, back again to, uh, to Britt. Yeah, I think our, our application interface is both cause and effect. So I'm curious, I've been so curious about how agriculture has changed the interactions between plants and their microbiome, and that drives a lot of our curiosity-based questions. But of course, also, we're very much interested in using this knowledge to generate plant probiotics and these types of um, tools to improve plant health and reduce chemical application. Right, so, I, so I, I guess it's pretty clear in, in your case, the basic science, it's pretty obvious um, where it's going to start showing up first in terms of applications that people are going to start, you know, they, they need to know um, this stuff. Uh, you know, and so it's, it's, uh, 
it will be obvious very soon, I think. Yes. Um, all right, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that uh, I, we, we're trying to keep our, our, our timing such that um, nobody has to sit in their seat on Zoom for their whole, uh, their whole evening. And, uh, and we just reached the, uh, the six o'clock time. So I want to um, uh, just conclude by actually now passing uh, the ball um, back to, uh, to uh, our other Dean who's here today, um, uh, Francis, Francis Hellman. And she's the Dean of the Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and President Elect of the American Physical Society. So she will be our, our, our next fearless leader um, in, in, in my field coming up. Um, she's a, obviously a professor of physics and uh, specifically um, her area is condensed matter um, experiment. She studies the thermodynamic properties of novel solid materials and especially the thin film semiconducting, superconducting, and magnetic materials, which have been really exciting in, in, in recent years. Um, and, and her work, of course, is also a perfect basic science story um, in, in the same way that it's you know, recently led her in all sorts of unexpected but exciting directions, including um, a, that her basic science is now actually going to be acting as the applied science to help some other basic science because she's become a member of the LIGO team that is working on the next generation of gravitational wave detectors. So, um, and so because of the properties of, 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 the, of these, uh, of Francis's, of, well, of Francis's new materials, they could end up being the perfect coatings that you need for the giant mirrors in these detectors. So anyway, I, I, it's, it's, it's another great example. And of course, we'll have another whole interview with Francis um, at, at a moment when she's not busy deaning um, uh, as well. So let me uh, just once more thank um, Heather, uh, Britton, and Hillel um, for, for uh, their work and pass the ball back, back to Francis. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Saul. And thank you, Heather, Britt, and Hillel for sharing your work, your ideas, your approaches to understanding the basic science, um, underpinning all these extremely different subfields. Um, you know, truly as Dean, the best part of my job is getting to hear and see how our faculty, you know, the excitement that you that you display around your research. Um, it, it's just, it's contagious and it's a great reminder of the importance of, of Berkeley, of the, you know, what, that we're able, that we're able to, to give you a, a space to, to undertake these amazing, um, these amazing experiments and, and, uh, and activities. Um, you know, whether we're looking at particles or the microbiome or the brain, the foundational underlying science is so clearly, the, you know, to my eyes, so clearly the essential part of this puzzle, the thing that is going to, that excites the researcher, you, and the students that are involved in the project, and hopefully all of you in the audience. Um, I'm hoping that you all felt, you know, a little bit caught that contagious excitement from the from everybody you heard today. I do want to say a special thank you to all our alumni and friends for gathering to hear and talk about these scientific discoveries and the process of discovery and understanding. This series of science talks is intended to shine a light on basic science and to share that excitement of discovery and the importance of basic science in all our scientific endeavors. Dean Bochin and I feel really strongly that while it's essential to look for medical cures and to look for new technologies, we must also focus on the foundational work that leads to those cures and to those technologies. You can't, you can't only focus on the final, the final thing of, you know, uh, some, some new way, some new approach to, a, to curing a disease or to, you know, a new battery. You have to do the foundational science that underpins all of that. And this foundational science has always been one of Berkeley's greatest strengths, and, and we believe it must continue to do so. Your support and your advocacy for Cal means everything to us and to the faculty. Heather, Britt, and Hillel, they're incredible students. They're really here, and they're only able to do their work in part because of the support that, that you offer. And, and um, we are just extremely gratified for your continued interest in Berkeley, alma mater to many of you, and to the ground, great groundbreaking work being done here. If there's anything you want to learn more about, or if you'd like to support our work, um, for which there is, as, as you can imagine, a deep need, please be in touch with us. We put some links to resources into the chat, and we will follow up with more information and more resources. We, absolutely want you to be part of advancing basic science and discovery at Berkeley. And, you know, if this, if you enjoyed tonight, then I think we have five more such events coming up and, and uh, each one of them will have their own flavor. But um, I certainly 
again, I'm so grateful to, to Saul, Heather, and Britt, and Halal for, for your presentation. It was inspiring. And with that, Fiat Lux, and I'm not seeing in the chat window the resources. Somebody was supposed to be, on, isn't somebody supposed to be posting in the chat window something? That was my, that was, I thought the note I had, but anyway, so hopefully if it's not soon in the chat window, I'm sure there, we will follow up with that. Okay. <laughs> Good. We will follow up with that. <laughs> so again, Fiat looks and have a, I hope everybody has a great evening and I hope you enjoyed yourselves tonight.